your Bible with you today, would you turn to Galatians chapter 3 and 4 with me is where we're going to be hanging out this morning as we prepare to take the Lord's Supper. We're going to be finishing up uh, our series on the kingdom and transitioning to our Christmas series this morning at the same time in Galatians. We'll start uh, actually in chapter 4 verse 1, but we'll be in Galatians chapter 3 verse 15 all the way down to Galatians 4 uh, chapter 7. As we get rolling this morning, we're going to start with God's Word. This is what it says in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different from a slave, though he is the owner of everything. This is kind of a weird thought. Uh, in, in, a, in a day where uh, a culture, a lifestyle, and I think sometimes we Americanize things more than reality. Um, but this is an inconceivable thought that Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, puts out before us. That a slave and an heir are the same. For, for hundreds of years... There have been sown in every part of every country and every world this idea of slavery and privilege. There, there's not been a corner of the earth, not, a, not a, a race or people that have been excluded. In fact, even, even in, in our day, we may, may or may not have experienced that type of slavery because of our our background of our culture but maybe we've experienced because of our socioeconomic slavery that that because this group of people has the affluence to have all that they want and to overcome hurdles this other group does not may, maybe we have it in this idea of historical or generational or even genetic sin the love the deep love of alcohol has run through my family tree. In fact, you might even say that I'm predisposed genetically to succumb to that more than another sin. And so does that mean then that I am a slave to that? Because I have that, and it's, it's, it's a struggle maybe for for me, or maybe you have a struggle in your world that, uh, and this is not a confession, your pastor, I don't struggle with alcohol. I don't drink it because I've seen what it does to my family. Here's my confession this morning. But, but here's what I want you to know. We all have something that is enslaved to us. And we think, God, well, why don't they have to deal with that slavery? It seems like they're privileged because they don't have to struggle with my mom, right? You know, they don't have to struggle with not having enough. For the whole summer, the first time I was introduced to Texas, egg salad sandwiches every day. That was lunch and dinner because it's all we had. We moved every year, rented house to house because we couldn't afford anything different. Every time the landlord increased the price, we moved. Five houses, five years, same neighborhood. Do you know there were times in my life as a child that I looked across the aisle to the person with the house and the family and thought, man, they have no idea what I'm struggling with. But so much so to when I started having children I saw families who their children were raised together in the same area their whole life, and I thought, oh, Lord, I covet that. See, I was a slave to this lifestyle, and they, they don't even know how good it is that they have. And, and yet Jesus, the Holy Spirit, inspiring Paul, has the audacity to say that the slave and the child of the heir are the same have they not read American history? That's garbage, right? Because the privileged and the slave are not the same. So either 
the Bible is wrong and we need to leave church now. Or God has something to show us about his kingdom and about his coming that we need to make sure we get before 1 Corinthians. We come and take the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. And here's the joy is that that may be confusing, but I want you to know it's, it's good news. I think that's why Paul says in verse 1, I mean that their error. When he says, I mean that, the Greek word, my son will love this, is lego. Right? Isn't that great? The Greek word here is, is lego. And, and lego literally means what I'm saying or what I'm trying to express. You see, Paul knew inspired by the Holy Spirit, that the church would have a hard time with this one. And so he says, what I'm, what I'm saying here is this. Have you ever had to say that? Maybe Thanksgiving dinner, someone brought over their, uh, their stuffing dish to you, right, or their dressing. And there's two ways that dressing happens, perfect and dry, amen? And it's hard to cook dressing I don't say that from experience. I say it from testing, right? And someone says, how do you like it? This is the most unique recipe. And they look at you and you say, sorry, what, what I'm trying to say is I've never had it like this before. Maybe, maybe not in a bad form, but, but when you're instructing or giving information to your children and you tell them very clearly, or ladies to your spouse and men to your wives, his, you say something really clearly and they look at you like, is that a language I don't understand? <laughs> and for you, it was very, very plain. You're a better door than a window. It means move, right? They look at you like, What? What I'm saying is, move. What I'm saying is, we're leaving for church now, and when we get there, you're going to smile, get your shoes on, and let's go. Have you ever had to, to say, what I'm, what I'm saying may be difficult for you to receive, but I want to make sure it comes across? That's what Paul says in, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 1. And, and in fact, to even get to four, verse 1 of chapter 4 and to even unpack the backside of it, we have to go all the way back to the context of the people that he's talking to. Because what he's trying to get across is so unique and so God-centered that it takes a history lesson to see how we may have misinterpreted where we stand before and after faith in Jesus Christ. So go all the way back, chapter 3, verse 15. And we're just going to rip this apart. Is that okay with you? We're just going to tear it up. And as we jump through God's word, we're just going to enjoy it and savor it a little bit. Verse 15 through 18 says it this way. To give a human example, brothers, I love this. I could have gone back further, but we don't have that much time. With Four or five hours later, we'll get there. To give a ex human example, brothers, in other words, just in case you haven't said it or understood it before, even with a man-made covenant, no one annuls it or adds to it once it's been ratified. I love that. In other words, once you have entered into a covenant... You don't add to it. You don't sweeten the deal once the name has been signed on the dotted line, nor do you say, well, that's no longer valid. It, once it's a covenant, it's a covenant. Now, the promises that were made to Abraham and to his offspring, it does not say to his offsprings, referring to many, but referring to one, and to your offspring, who is Christ. This is what I mean. Do, do you see this happening? He wants to make sure it comes across. The law, which came 430 years afterward, does not annul the covenant previously ratified by God. 
so as to make the promise void. For if the inheritance comes by the law, then it no longer comes by the promise. But God gave it to Abraham by the promise. You see, if we're going to understand freedom and the kingdom and Christmas and the Lord's Supper, we have to understand that maybe somewhere in our background, we have misunderstood God's promise. That, that, that somewhere along the way, we have misunderstood it. You see, what Paul's telling the people is this, is before the covenant was given, before the law was, was made and, and shared with Moses on the mountain, before we could say, here are all the things that need to be done to be right with God. Here's all the things that you need to endure to be right with God. The law. So before that ever happened, God said to Abraham, your offspring will bless the earth. Now here's the beautiful thing. The people who were in the lineage of Abraham, the Israelites and the Jewish people, believed that individually, in keeping the law, that they were their fulfillment in some way, shape, or form of the promise. And isn't that really easy to do? Isn't it really easy to misunderstand that promise individually? To think, you know what? If I do what God wants me to do, I can endure what I need to endure. I can win where I need to win. I can, can keep the commandments. I can keep the law. When I, when I fail, I'm punished. When I, when I win, it, it glorifies God. Like, I, the whole blessing of those around me is going to be based on how many great things I can do or endure so that I can be the blessing. See, when those thoughts creep in, that if I don't, it will never somehow we start thinking this misunderstood promise idea. Because what, what Paul goes out of his way to say is this, the promise that God is going to bless the world through Abraham's offspring is singular, not plural. The offspring through whom the whole world would be blessed by, verse 16, is Christ. You see, the blessing comes from one Jesus. If you and I are trying to bring the kingdom to someone for Jesus without Jesus, we've misunderstood the promise. If you and I, by our actions and our deeds, are trying to bring the kingdom into our household and raising our children without Jesus, we must understand the promise. If you and I bring our children to church, if you and I bring our children downstairs every day, and we do every, we make them do a Bible study, we make them hold strong, we make them wear the Jesus t-shirts that have fun sayings on them. If we do all that we can without Jesus being the one through whom it's working through, Paul says, then it probably feels like you're living in slavery right now, doesn't it? And you don't know how to get free. You see, the law was never the promise giver. It, it wasn't. The, the promise was to come through Jesus. And then the natural question was asked is, so what does that mean? Look in your Bible, go a little bit further to verse 19 through 22. This is what the Bible says. It says, why then the law? What was the point of the law? And then, in fact, I can imagine someone saying, wait, why, why, do I, why, why do we even have this measure out here, this plumb line? What was the point? If it wasn't to tell me how to obtain the blessing and how to be the blessing, then what's the goal? What's the point? Paul says it was added because of transgressions until the offspring should come to whom the promise had been made. And it was put in place through angels by an intermediary. Now an intermediary implies more than one, but God is one. 
In other words, sometimes an intermediary can make it feel like there's two parties and someone with equal authority comes in. And Paul says, before you get that out of the way, there's just one. God put the angels in as the intermediary to work between him and us. He's, he's orchestrating it all. And the orchestration, we now see the blessing is Jesus because God is one. Verse 21, the law then is contrary to the promises. Is the law then contrary to promises of God? Paul says, certainly not. For if the law had been given that could give life, then the righteousness would indeed be by the law. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so the promise by faith in Christ Jesus might be given to those who believe. You see, part of the issue with not being able to embrace the kingdom in Jesus Christ is that we are struggling to please a master who isn't there. See, sin is highlighted by the law. It's not removed. That's when slavery becomes evident. Isn't that amazing what the law does? You know, when I get pompous and a little bit full of my ability, all I have to do is look at the law to be reminded how imperfect I am. When I get judgmental, all I have to do is look at the law and find out how perfect I am. When, when I start to compare X and Y and Z, all I have to do is look at the law. Why? Because the law does this. It makes our sin obviously evident. That's why it feels like prison. Because the law was a plumb line, a guide to show us the goodness, just a taste of the perfection of God. And to, to say, listen, live like this. The whole point was for it to show us what life is supposed to be like with God and how often we are living apart from that. It exposes our sin. Does that make the law bad? No. Just like the white lines on the road are there to show you where the cliff is. Then after the white lines, you know what they added? Those little ridges in the road. Does anyone know what those ridges sound like? Because you've crossed the white line. And if you're like me, every time you hit them, your wife says, whoa, and you're like, no, I know, I know. No one hits the ridges just, just to ride on them for fun unless they're trying to annoy children. That's a different sermon. Yeah, test driving cars. My, my car decided to semi-explode the other day, and so we're test driving cars. And this guy says, hey, this has this new drive assist thing. We're going 45, 50, 60 miles an hour, and he hits this button and says, watch, I'm going to take my hands off the wheel, and we're going to go off the road. It'll push us back on. I'm like, I know Jesus. Do you? You're crazy. <laughs> sure enough, we cross this right line, and you get this nudge, and we start going back this way. I'm like, maybe that's how it feels to be on a boat. You just let this thing drive. It just the law exposes our sin. So, so if you and I live on the basis of how we are a blessing or not, if we live in the blessing of God, if we gauge our relationship or think we will find rightness with God by how many good things we can do or bad things we're not doing, compared to the law, welcome to slavery. You're trying to please a master, and it's the wrong one. And the beautiful thing is, is that we're not alone. Verse 23 through 29. Now, there, now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under the guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, you have put on Christ. There is not Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female. All are one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring. Singular, singular. Heirs according to the promise. You see, the identity of all men was being guarded by the law until Christ would come. 
what it means is, is regardless of who you are, where you are, what you have, or what you don't have, no matter who is being what way to you or, or who is being um, sweet or, or angry, re regardless of the position in life that you think you're in, before Jesus Christ and outside of Jesus Christ, your identity is just being guarded by the law. You see, it, it's showing... It's showing that you're a sinner. But when Christ came, the blessing was that his oneness replaced division. Isn't that amazing? That, that, that in, the blessing in Christ is that oneness replaces division. And I want to be careful because I don't want to go too far of horizontal division. What did the law show us? Who were we enslaved to in the law? We were enslaved to sin. That's the obviousness. Who were, were the people, who, when we are in sin, when the people of God in the Old Testament were in sin, who were they enslaved to? Sin. Who were they out of relationship with? God. You see, so when, so when Christ came and we are justified by faith, our division is replaced by oneness with him. So that captivity that the law gained, that, that just felt like it just kept telling us, like we said last week, pothole, 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 pothole. I don't want to live my life avoiding the potholes. The, the Bible says all you have to understand is the law is your pothole finder. And it's going to tell you when you hit them and when you miss them. God didn't mean for you to live that way, this division from him, you're missing his glory. So instead, faith has come. The law is no longer our guardian. If we think of an heir, when he grows up, that thing which showed him he was a slave, now is a part of his life. He's under, he's over the guardian. This is an amazing thing now. We live by faith in Christ. Does that mean the law is unimportant? Absolutely not. It just means it's not there to keep us pothole, pothole, pothole. It, it's there to show us Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. It, it, it's there to remind us of who we are now. And in that, Paul says, you put on Christ. And because you're one with Christ, you're one with Christ, church. Jesus prays, let them be one, Father, as we are one. It's recorded in the book of John. It doesn't mean that, that, that when Jesus came, that the, the Jewish race ceased to be, or that the Greek race ceased to be, or that men stopped being men, or women stopped being men. It doesn't mean any of that. David's card was perfect. It just means that we now see ourselves as Christians. Regardless of what you have or what you don't, regardless of what you look like or what you don't, regardless of what you think or where you've been or your past or your genetics or your upbringings or X, Y, or Z, in Christ Jesus, through faith comes this blessing of oneness to replace the division that kept us from experiencing and knowing the kingdom. That's where chapter 4 comes into play. Look at verse 1 through 3. The Bible says it this way. I mean that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no different than a slave. Though he is the owner of everything, but he is under guardians and managers until the date set by his father. In the same way, we also, when we were children, were enslaved to the elementary principles of the world. Church, what an amazing idea. Isn't it funny on the tail end of the kingdom of God conversations that, that God let the good fish and the bad fish be in this net at the same time until the father comes. He separates them out. It, it, interesting that the landowner said, let the weeds and the wheat grow together because if the wheat was trying to identify the weeds, there's no basis. There's no grounds. When it's ready for harvest, that's when the master sends it out. Church, you and I have no idea who the weeds and the wheat are, who the good and the bad fish are, apart from those fish who already, we love this, have the stench of Jesus Christ. Man, for those who bear and 
and are drenched in Christ. You're not an heir under supervision like a slave. The Father set you free through Jesus Christ. Now, here's the beautiful thing. There are other fish in this net with us, and we don't know who is and who isn't. So what are we to do? I, I think by the name and the grace of Jesus Christ, we're just supposed to expose our freedom. Let's make it known. Why do I think that? Because that's what God did. Look in your Bible, verse, verse 4, verse 5. Verse 4, it says it this way. It says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law. This is the beautiful thing. This is what God did. At God's perfect time, number one, if you and I are going to act and live for Jesus, it has to be in his timing and not our own. Why? Because you are either too lazy or too aggressive. Your timing's not right. My timing's not right. But in the fullness of time, at just the right time, God did something. He sent his son. He sent the offspring. He sent the blessing. At God's perfect timing, if you and I are going to embrace God's will, embrace his kingdom, we need to be aware and have our eyes open for the fullness of his time. And his son needs to be priority in whatever we're doing. Not how we feel, not what we want, not what we think. In the fullness of time, born of a woman, the Bible says under the law this is important because this shows that jesus is able where you and i are, are not able and I, and I know the desire is as a pastor is that jesus would affirm my plans and then use them but that's not how god works god says listen you were under the law you were under sin you were a slave no matter if you were the king's son or the child of a fifth generation slave you're under the law. And so God, the King of kings and Lord of lords, sent his son, born of a woman, which means under the law. It's like God planted his son in the prisoner's cell with us. And look at verse 5 and see what happened. The Bible says, to redeem those who are under the law so we may receive adoption as son. Church, we are no longer slaves. You are not a slave to the sin of your past. You are not trying to pay off debts that have always been too deep for you to repay. Because Jesus Christ has redeemed you. The word redeemed literally means liberated. He didn't have to start an uprising because he needed no one else's help. Isn't that amazing? He didn't, he didn't gather a movement. He didn't rally the troops because he didn't need it. We've been rallying troops our whole life and haven't escaped the bondage of sin. So Jesus, sent by God, born of a woman, under the law, in the jail cell with us, liberate us from the law. He didn't break the law. This is the difference. He fulfilled it. He made it no longer have power over those who he would be liberating. Church, in Jesus Christ, you can know freedom. There's no other way. You can't know it in your marriage. You can't know it in your business. You can't know it in your heart. Because no matter how rich you are, no matter how many goals you esteem in life, without freedom, you're still a prisoner to your past. Read almost any news article on your page today. People are acting out because they have not received liberation from Jesus Christ. He didn't just liberate us, though. He didn't just free us so that we can go wild. He didn't just let the prison doors open so we could run around. The Bible says he redeemed us so that for purpose we might receive, verse 5, adoption as sons. Christ made us recipients of the kingdom. He, 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 
He gave us a new identity. This week he said, remember when I said, put on Christ? This is what I meant. When he redeems you, you take on his identity. You're no longer what your job defines you as. You're no longer what your school defines you as, what your, what your accomplishments define you as, or what your lack of accomplishment. You're no longer. You're now a recipient of Jesus Christ. You are beautiful. You are, you are not worthy of punishment any longer. You are not worthy of death. You are not worthy. In Jesus Christ, you have been liberated. Be a recipient of that. Don't hold on to what you think you deserve. Because here's how greatly you've been liberated. Verse 6. And because you are sons, God has spent, sent his spirit of his son into our hearts crying, Abba, Father. Church, that means that Christ has given us a privileged place with the Father. He's given you a privileged place with the Father. I want you to process that. No one before Jesus Christ would have ever cried out to God, Abba, Father. Abba is a, is a daddy. You know, my mom called my granddad daddy his whole life. Do you know, I called him granddaddy. Some people called him Bill, other called him coach. But you know, I never ever saw a grown man on the street come up to my, my granddaddy, huge, big man, say, hey, daddy. Because they didn't have that privilege. That was a privilege reserved for his children. You see, no one can approach the throne of the Lord based on their accomplishments or achievements no matter how many you've got because there's no privilege in your accomplishments privilege is given not earned when it comes to the throne of grace and so the Lord says I have not just given you the privilege I've given you my spirit to cry out from within you Abba, Father, Daddy. It, it, and it's not just Daddy, I'm, I'm dying, I'm hurting, help. It's Daddy. Look what I'm clothed in. Daddy, guess what I got to do today? Daddy, I mean, you won't believe what I just saw. I mean, I know you'll believe it because you were there, but I need to tell you again. Daddy. Did you see that, Daddy? Yeah, I saw that. You are no longer slaves because the division has been removed. In Jesus Christ, the Bible says in verse 7, not my words, but his. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Church, our world is not out of control. It's, it's not even in more danger today than it was 50 years ago. Because when we are in slavery, in our misery, we are just trying to achieve something. And that is where our world is. And there's no freedom of man that will let that go. But God sent his son in the fullness of his time, born of a woman into slavery, underneath the law, that he might liberate us, free us, so that we might be sons, heirs, privileged, free church this morning as we take the Lord's Supper that's the invitation to get your heart ready he who is set free is free indeed why? because of what he's done this morning you may need freedom even if you've been carrying the name of Christ on your shoulder for years you may have just been saying the Lord will not or I'm still struggling I'm, I can't be freed from it 
Bible says in Christ, you already are. Stop worrying about the potholes. Keep your eye on the privilege. Let's pray. Father God, you're so good. I understand the law. Lord, as we talked about in our life group this morning, I understand the slavery of Egypt, no matter how bad it was, because I understood how to live within that society, God. And it's confusing to be rescued. Father God, in this room today, there are some that are in the same place. Lord, by my grace, I want to save people. By my grace, I want to please you. By my grace, I want to overcome my demons. I want to, I want to battle the things that are attacking. By my grace and by my strength, that's what I want, Father God. But that is slavery. I hear Paul say it over and over. What I mean to say is this. What I mean to say is this. Are you getting it? Father God, this morning, let me get it. put on Christ so that I can be freed and I can receive and I can cry out Lord God it's not about what I can do or what I want it's about who you are so Lord as we stand and sit here today let your kingdom come Abba Father in your name we pray you stand with me this morning. We have our time of invitation. However God calls you, would you respond?